following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. Hello, listeners around the world on radio, streaming, and podcast services. This is It's Not Therapy. I'm Leanna Kersner, and I am not a therapist, but I am your source for practical advice for everyday problems, using my top 10 sayings for checking in with your best self. This episode, I'm going to talk about spoons. No, not the tick catchphrase, specifically the way spoons are used in mental health circles as a metaphor for units of energy that a person has on a given day. If you didn't understand the catchphrase line, that's okay. It's a comic book reference. The guest this week, my guest this week, is Penn State psychology professor Kevin Bennett talking to us about better ways to manage your time, energy, attention span, basically spoons. You can tell I really enjoy that. Spoons as a metaphor for energy. That term was coined by Christine Miserandino in 2003. Apologize if I messed up that last name. Christine was having a meal with a friend and spoons were available to use as an example of a tangible unit of energy a person has to do whatever task need doing in a given day. Energy spoons are a way to communicate what it's like living with a disability, mental illness, physical illness, what have you. In Christine Miserandino's case, it was lupus. For many people these days, it's long COVID. In my case, it's mixed connected to tissue disease. I know what's that, I can barely say it. TMJ and long COVID. Yeah, there are a lot of reasons I became interested in mental health stuff. Here's how energy spoon theory works. Imagine everyone has 12 energy spoons for use in everything they need to do in a given day. I just made up the number 12. There's nothing sacred about it. On a good day, living with a chronic mental or physical health condition, someone only needs to use one or two spoons to deal with it. On a bad day, well, it can be four, six, eight spoons, just dealing with the illness. Obviously, that leaves far fewer spoons left to do anything else. Now, a lot of people discriminate against people like me. They think we're less useful to society. We're lazy. We're a bad hire, blah, blah. This is short-sighted and lacks wisdom. Somebody with fewer spoons to work with. Well, we become a better judge of what's really important in life. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about for the next 50-ish minutes. Yeah, not quite less. If you want to ask a question, I am very giddy tonight. 289-275-9600. 289-275-9600. Or email me, liana at nottherapyshow.com. That's L-I-A, N as in Nancy A, at nottherapyshow.com. If that's too much to remember, go to nottherapyshow.com and fill out the contact form. Or you can get extra content at Not Therapy Show on Twitter and Instagram. Okay, how to use your spoons. My personal clients know that I have a huge amount of compassion, a ton of empathy, loads of insight, and plenty of pop culture references, and absolutely no tolerance for BS. That's just me. If someone's legitimately doing the work, pursuing their passions, or legitimately struggling, I'll give them all to help them get the better that they deserve. All I need is a sincere effort. But if someone starts pulling nonsense, nonsense is not the word I want to use, but this is an all ages show. Somebody starts pulling nonsense, I'm not going to be a good fit for them. There are a lot of therapists out there. I am not a therapist, but therapists who have licenses might have techniques to deal with that. Other, let's face it, they're just happy to take someone's money. Either way, it's not me. We all have things we're better and worse at dealing with. Things that take away a greater or fewer number of our spoons. Because of my personal history with therapy, people who don't do the work drain me way more than someone with that therapeutic detachment. 
that's not what I do. That's why I'm not a therapist. I'm not detached. I'm invested. So people who are not willing to do the work, bad use of my spoons. And I have a waiting list right now. So bad use of other people's time. Now, if you're feeling sensitive about the not doing the work comment, hear me out. Okay. I get it. Just because you've been told you're not doing the work by a therapist or a coach or anybody, that doesn't mean it's true. Going back to that stigma against clients with disabilities. I work with a lot of people who are branded difficult by therapists, accused of not doing the work. But what it really is, is that the work, the tools these therapists are talking about, require too many spoons at once for people with disabilities or neurodivergencies to be able to handle. That reality that I faced when I was in therapy was how I came up with the way I do things. I had to figure out techniques that built me up instead of constantly tearing me down because they exhausted all my spoons. And surprising to me, I had to figure that out on my own. Therapists only gave me the most vague sense of how to do it. And in this instance, vague means that they gave me a destination. Set boundaries, for instance. But no map to get to that X marks the spot. So I had no idea how to do it, what direction, what it meant. Now, I was told to break things down into smaller, more manageable pieces. That, that was clear, that counseling. But the pieces never seemed to get small enough to be manageable. Now, eventually, and it took me months of getting nowhere before I figured this out, but eventually, I realized that it wasn't just the size of the tasks I was attempting. It was the nature of them. I was trying to do things that were either impossible or that I just wasn't at all good at. Obviously, attempting to do the impossible runs out your spoons. Impossible things I was trying to do included trying to get people to like me who had a vested interest in seeing me fail. Trying to set boundaries with people who didn't understand boundaries and generally try to be someone I was not. The TV industry, well, the Canadian TV industry, yeah, you know, my... My experience with the U.S. TV industry, same. It's great at demanding the impossible from people. There's all these unwritten rules that people expect you to know. And a lot of what I'll call nicely reverse accountability. Meaning people blame other people for the things they actually did. Yeah. My favorite anecdote of you know, advising the impossible, demanding the impossible, was there was this publicist and she was working on a pretty prominent local TV show. No, it was shot locally. It was a U.S. show. So pretty prestigious, right? She was willing to give me some help and advice. Great, right? Well, not so great. Because when I asked for advice about how to handle people who were determined to you know, say horrible things about me, false things. What do you do when someone's determined not to like me? Her response, I'm not kidding, this is a quote. Her advice was, make them like you, you cow. Now, not only had I never been called any sort of bovine before that moment, but that's the opposite of the truth. I mean, I know that now, but at the time I was like, how do I do this? The truth is you can't make anyone like you. You can only try to persuade them to like you. But you know, she was the expert. What did I know? I felt like a failure for a really long time because I had no idea how to make someone like me. Because it's not possible to make someone like you. Now, this is part of the reason I created the top 10 phrase, healthy goals are based on things you can control. You can't control the mean things, mean people in a mean industry or mean about because they're mean people in a mean industry. No one 
is 100% persuasive. Effective communicators know which conversations aren't worth having. Some people are just never going to like you. They're not your people. Now, the second main thing that was exhausting my spoons is a trickier thing. Stuff I wasn't good at. I'm still not the best at. Now, sometimes, yeah, you got to get good. But sometimes you're never going to be good enough. And trying too much to improve that particular skill is not a good use of time. For me, my Waterloo, do 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 my Waterloo, is sales. Sales. Periodically try to be a better salesperson, but communicating to try to get someone to do what I want them to do is the exact opposite of, you know, my main skill set. Giving another person mental health tools for their well-being. Yeah, that's about what the other person wants to do, not what I talk them into. Talking people into things in that environment is bad, unethical, and potentially dangerous. Now, admitting you're never going to be really good at something is difficult because it means you have to find people to help you. And asking for help is something I have been historically terrible at. That was historically, I got fancy there, been historically, historically terrible at asking for help. But I knew it was something I needed to work on. And I know it's something I need to continue to work on. Even though that sometimes exhausts my spoons, that is something worth the spoons. Because no one can do anything. So asking for help is an essential life skill. So even though asking for help, learning how to ask for help better and more often sucks up a lot of spoons, I take that as a good investment of the spoons. The reason my top 10 phrase, perfect is a lie, stop trying to be perfect, is so strongly worded is because I need a good kick in the butt on that one. Admitting we have weaknesses makes us stronger. Trying to be perfect, on the other hand, well, that's a huge weakness because it's not possible. Hmm. Admitting we have weaknesses makes us stronger. That's a good alternative top 10 phrase. Well done, self. Thanks, self. Okay, I'm getting punchy. Yeah, it's time for a break. If you have a question based on that goofiness with spoons, give me a call, 289-275-9600, 289-275-9600, or Leanna at nottherapyshow.com, L-I-A-N is in Nancy, A at nottherapyshow.com, or the contact form at nottherapyshow.com, or Twitter, Instagram, at nottherapyshow. When we come back, psychology professor Kevin Bennett from Penn State here to talk to us about more tips on how to spend your time and your spoons wisely each day. We'll be back after this break on It's Not Therapy. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. It's time once again for the It's Not Therapy interview, talking how to spend your time through a day. I am here with a great guest. I'm here with Kenneth Bennett, PhD. He's a psychology professor at Penn State. Kevin's got a podcast coming up. I'll say that at the end of the interview because it's not out yet. So I want to plug it, but in advance, Kevin, thanks for joining us on It's Not Therapy. It is my pleasure to be here. I'm excited to talk with you today. Today. Now, you wrote this great article on Psychology Today about a wonderful internet title, right? What's the worst way to use your time during the day? And yeah, yeah. And, and this is, I mean, I hear from clients all the time that they end up in the YouTube spiral where they end up just watching YouTube for two hours and not getting anything done. Uh, what inspired you to tackle this topic? 
Well, you know, I, I write articles for psychology today. I'm a, a, a psychology professor at, at Penn State. So I teach classes and I'm always interacting with students uh, and asking them, you know, what's bothering them, what makes them happy. And the issue of routines and time management always comes up because some students just seem to get it, mm -hmm. or maybe they've had a lot of practice doing it and they're just better at it. And other students seem totally clueless. So I'm always thinking about uh, routines and what makes a good routine during your day and what makes a you know less effective or just counterproductive routine. Uh, so it's something that's always on my mind and I don't, you know, I have my own routine and way of managing time and that may work for me, but it doesn't necessarily work for other people. But my my background is I'm interested in personality science at the mm -hmm. intersection of urban design and mental health. So I'm really uh, focused on how we can organize the space, the physical and social space around us so that we can maximize uh, productivity and, and happiness. Uh, and so I uh, basically I started interviewing people to find out what their routines were like and, and what were some of the, the common themes that emerged. And then recently I wrote this article for Psychology Today and just kind of squeezed it down to four or five major points. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really where that was the, the catalyst behind this article. Now, one of the things I notice, I'm a Gen Xer, so I see modern spaces. You know, Google was the one that started the open office where people can just flop to the side and, you know, these big open concept rooms where everybody's got headphones on. I find those rooms incredibly distracting. And you, you zero it on distractions in your article. Uh, Talk, talk to me about distractions and how how the brain works, because I think a lot of people go, oh, no, I'm fine. I can multitask. I'm a person that I can't even listen to music with lyrics while I'm working on writing or emails. I'll end up writing the lyrics I'm listening to into the email. <laughs> so how does the brain actually work regarding distractions? That's so funny because I'm the same way when it comes oh. to lyrics. Uh, I'm also a Gen Xer as well. So hello, fellow yeah. Gen Xer. There we go. We're the, we're the slackers, right? Um, yeah, so distractions, this is another thing I ask my students all the time. I, I say, well, how do you study? You know, how, when you have to write a report or study for something, what do you do? And I get so, there's so much variation in the answers. Um, but the number one approach to getting something done, if you have to write something or study for something, is to completely avoid distractions. And I mean, isolate yourself physically and, and socially uh, and even emotionally, if possible, for a short period of time. Because, uh, you know, I ask students, what do you do? And they all say, well, not all of them, but a lot of them say, you know, I listen to music, I'm texting and I'm writing or and I'm reading. And so they're doing two or three or even four things at the same time because that's all they've ever done uh, right. for, for a lot of these students, younger people. Uh, and I tell them, you know, I know you don't want to hear this. You want to hear shortcuts <laughs> to getting things done. Right. But the best way to do it is to just wall yourself off from everything else, uh, including music for the most part. Uh, and just get your task done. Now, when it comes to music with lyrics versus no lyrics, uh, I'm I'm a little more uh, I'm friendlier to the idea of listening to music that does not have lyrics because that's something I do. Like I listen to jazz and classical music yep. without lyrics. Yeah. Uh, because just like you, if I listen, if I'm trying to write or read something and I'm listening to lyrics, I get totally distracted. Um, so I have to have on something in the background that's either just you know, not very important at all. That's not going to mm -hmm. catch my ear or just turn it off entirely. But I have a lot of students that say, you know, I listen to music with lyrics all the time and it doesn't hurt me. It helps me because it motivates me. And I don't know, I'm skeptical <laughs> about that. I mean, I know there's this energy, this, this kind of, you feel like you're in this flow or this mm -hmm. zone, whenever you're listening to music. Um, but it doesn't necessarily translate into better writing and better reading comprehension. It might work for running or working out, listening to music with lyrics, but not necessarily getting uh, schoolwork done. Or, or even uh, art, something visual where you're not actually having to process words in your brain, right? If I'm doing something in Photoshop, I'll have my electro swing songs up, right? But yeah, when I'm trying exactly, to write, yeah. it's, it's Chet Baker instrumentals you know that kind of stuff because i think 
you know, we we have so focused on socialization and popularity and you're all on the same team. Millennials and Gen Z have been bombarded with that message. Um, and I think it's backfired a little because that connectivity, which is another thing you emphasize, is becoming such a priority that the distractions, it's that, it's that whole FOMO thing, right? That whole FOMO principle, fear of missing out. Right. That the, the emphasis is so on, oh, the opinions of your peers matter so much. The opinions of your teachers, the opinions of somebody matter so much that that concentration, that that being a person who can separate from other people and be OK with that has gotten sort of lost. But let's let's pivot to that quality socialization. Because I think that deep friendships have also been sacrificed for sort of a, quali a quantity over quality approach. Am I off base here? No, not at all. And, and I think that, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I included in this article, I included being connected or staying connected mm -hmm. uh, was because I, th I think sometimes we forget about that. and We think I've got to move forward and get things done. Uh, and we we remember, oh, I, you know, I need to take a break, I guess, if I get tired. But it's also important to keep that social connection. And I'm not really here. I'm not really talking about texting people or going on mm -hmm. Facebook or Twitter or anything like that. I'm, I'm talking about real face to face, in person communication. Uh, and I, I really think that sense of belonging is our most fundamental human social need. Uh, uh -huh. It's universal. It goes back to the beginning of human history. And even before that, other mammals and other species, they need to be connected to uh, friends and family and allies. Uh, and it's no different for us. So we have this very, very fundamental need to stay connected. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons why cults work. <laughs> so there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a negative side to it. But we have this this urge to be uh, a part of something and belong somewhere physically, socially, emotionally. And the most fundamental social category that we use in everyday language is us versus them or right. we and they. Uh, and it, it's funny because those terms are so fluid. They change from one sentence to the next. Uh, and we have very little difficulty understanding who the we and the they are for the most part. Like if I say, uh, if I'm at a restaurant and I say uh, to the, the server, we did not get our salads. I'm not talking about everyone in the restaurant. I'm talking about we at our table. But if I say to my students, we have an exam Friday, mm -hmm. I don't mean everyone at the university. I mean, just our class. Mm -hmm. And if I say we won the gold medal in the Olympics, I'm talking about our country. So the we and the they changes constantly. And, and we usually just automatically process it every once in a while you have to say things to somebody like well who are the they that you're talking about right you'll right. hear people say well they say this and they say that and sometimes i want to say well who who are they <laughs> that you're talking about um but other than that we pretty much get it and so my point is the the idea of group membership and who we are and us uh that's that's really ingrained in us and it's it, it's for a reason because it's very, very important that we have that sense of belonging. Uh, and so as you're doing your work during your day, it's important to remember, hey, how am I connected? How do I belong to this uh, this immediate environment that I'm in right now at the moment? Yeah, that's one of the big red flags I've seen in the modern workplace. Um, I like to think of workplace teams as like a Dungeons and Dragons party. Everybody's got their role and you all have to work together to slay the dragon. But more and more in this age of remote work where companies have monitoring programs put on people's computers, the idea of socializing, of getting to know your colleagues is seen increasingly as wasting time. And it got to the point that I don't know if you saw any of those stories about all the document dumps that were coming out of Twitter. I thought, does nobody have a face to face conversation at this company? And All right. that's true of Google as well. So much is done on chats because, oh, socializing is a waste of time. Getting to know people are a waste of time. We all have our tasks. It's all about the product. I think you're right that that's not so. Having those periods where you get to know your coworkers and your clients and, you know, your, your suppliers. So you more accurately 
understand what they're telling you because language is more art than science, right? And most people use heuristics. And I think that in that us and them paradigm, I think that's a big part of it that we don't stop, ask for clarification, find out where another person's coming from. We just sort them into the them group and then we're actually less productive because we're spending so much time on defense that we're not being productive. We're not moving forward. Am I way off base there? No, I think you're right on. And and you mentioned um, getting to know your colleagues and people that you work with uh, is is really important. In fact, we hit at my place of uh, work last night, we had a get together at a local uh, restaurant after it was like a happy hour thing. Mm. Um, and just organizing that, even at a small campus like where I'm at, uh, it's like pulling teeth, getting oh, yeah. people to go out after work and say, hey, we're not getting we're not even talking about work. We just want right. to like have drinks or get something to eat and does just talk as yeah. as friends. And uh, it's like impo- and people have to send out these emails reminding others, hey, at five o'clock today, we're meeting up at this place for a f- you know fun social hour. Yeah. And it's really important if you actually go which I have to admit, I didn't go because I was busy with other things, but uh, I would normally go. Uh, if you go, if you force yourself to go, you'll just feel better afterwards because you you have these nice little chats with people and it, it might not even be important things that you talk about, but you're getting so much emotional and, and nonverbal information from people when you meet face to face uh, that you just don't get over chats, even zoom calls. Um, there's just no substitute for that. And I think it's really fundamental to human existence to have those interactions on a pretty regular basis. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm very introverted as a person. People don't believe me because I'm in media, but I am very introverted. And I, even, I know getting to know someone sort of understanding how they tick is really important. But the other thing about socializing like that is it is a brain break, right? When you're in person, you don't have three screens in front of you. You don't have all these things distracting. You have an excuse to not answer your cell phone any minute. And those breaks are people, you know, dismiss them as laziness if you're not go, go, going all the time. But the brain is not designed to be intense, intensely focused on a task all day. We need those breaks throughout the day, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a couple of things come to mind when you when you talk about this. And one is uh, the concept of a restorative niche or niche. I always said niche growing up, but then then I got to graduate school and everyone started saying niche, but <laughs> N-I-C-H-E, uh, niche, a restorative niche. And this is a, a concept that was came to my attention via uh, Brian Little. He's a personality psychologist who does some uh, amazing work on happiness and optimism, things like that. Um, but he says that we all need to find our restorative niche and it's different for introverts and extroverts. You mentioned introverts and, and I too am an introvert. That's how I would classify myself. Mm. Not extreme, but if you had to pick one side or the other on that continuum, I would say I'm an introvert mm-hmm. and my students are surprised because yeah. I get up and lecture for an hour and I'm very extroverted when I lecture because I have to be, it's part of That's my right. job. If That's I was right. really introverted, it would be a terrible class. So I have to summon all my energy <laughs> and my reserves to be extroverted and, and entertaining and, and be be a, you know, a commanding sort of speaker mm-hmm. in front of a large group, uh, but I'm exhausted afterwards because I'm an introvert. And so I have to find my restorative niche, which is basically my office. I come back to my office, I turn on water sounds, I put the lights down the way right. I like them. And that's how I, I relax and kind of restore. And then I'm ready for the next meeting or the next event. Uh, but an extrovert who's doing the same thing uh, as me, they might actually come away from that lecture feeling more energized because mm-hmm. extroverts tend to feed off the energy of other people. So they prefer to be around other people because it motivates them. Uh, whereas introverts, it's just the opposite. You're around other people and you either get anxious, nervous, yeah. or you get a little more stressed than you need yeah. to be. Yeah. Uh, and so it takes its toll differently on introverts versus extroverts. And therefore, those different personality types have to find different restorative uh, niches. But mm-hmm. but the brain, I'll mention this as well, since you talked about how the brain processes this, this kind of information. I mean, if you, if you were to simplify what the brain does, like this is an, an insane oversimplification, uh, the brain just processes sensory information from the outside world 
that's coming in through our five sensory systems, you know, vision, taste, touch, et cetera. Uh, and if you were to take that away, so if you had nothing coming in through your five sensory systems, mm -hmm. you couldn't see anything, hear anything, taste anything, touch anything, um, what would your brain be doing? It would be spinning. It would be right. reeling, looking for something to process. Right. And that's essentially what sensory deprivation tanks do, which is a topic for another day, I suppose. Right. But it's kind of cool because some people like to go into those sensory deprivation tanks because it actually relaxes them. But for extreme extroverts, going in a sensory deprivation tank is one of the most traumatic things you can do because you, uh, you're, you're alone. You're completely alone with your brain and your thoughts and there's you know nothing else that's, that's happening. So it can be kind of a terrifying uh, existence. That, that music and my sudden franticness means we have to pause for a break. There's going to be more with Kevin Bennett and time and energy management after this quick break. Please stay tuned on It's Not Therapy. More of the interview to come after this. The following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. And we are still talking to Penn State psychology professor Kevin Bennett talking about how to spend your time wisely. And before the break, we were talking about the different needs of introverts and extroverts. Yeah. And so often companies prioritize one over the other. And I mean, you know, we, we get obsessed with the big five personality indicators and, oh, extroversion is a marker of greater success it's because you know this is your field of expertise the world of work is designed for that um but we're reimagining productivity i think now and the fact that we are at an age where another thing you put we have to make room for exercise because we don't walk everywhere and we're not lifting things everything's automated for us we have machines so now we have to make sure we get that movement in. And I know I'm really bad for going, oh, I have this thing, you know, I wake up, there's an email, I have to hit the ground running. So, and I'll go four days without exercising. And I'm like, okay, got to make time for this. And then somebody complains I'm unavailable, but it's like too bad, no, priorities, right? What does exercise do in terms of productivity and using time effectively? Well, you know, the old saying healthy, mind, healthy body, that yeah. sort of thing. I mean, it's absolutely true. I mean, and there's good data on this. Um, and I, I just, I read an article recently uh, about getting exercise and being, being outside even more than exercise. Mm. It's just being outside, but usually when you're outside uh, you know, you're walking or something uh, and just being outside for two hours a week and just walking, you don't have to even be running or anything mm -hmm. uh, that, that, results in a significant impact in uh, or an increase in overall well-being and happiness and all those positive uh, things that you can measure. Uh, and it seems that the magic number is two hours. So mm. if you're only outside for one hour per week, it's not enough. And once you get above two hours, there's you know diminishing returns right. on that. But in right. two hours is not that much to be outside. I mean, no. not a day. I'm talking about an entire week is what this study said. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Uh, and that goes hand in hand with with exercise in my mind. The idea that you're out in nature, you're moving around a little bit, doesn't have to be vigorous, intense exercise, just a little bit of movement. Uh, and and the result of that is you expend a little bit of energy, so you feel like oh now I'm a, I'm a little bit more hungry. I feel like I'm you know my joints are warmed up, and maybe I'm a little bit tired, even muscles sore. Uh, those are good feelings to have. And if you look at uh, you know, our, our ancestors from 10,000 generations ago, they were incredibly mobile. They were moving everywhere. They didn't really sit in place all that much because their existence depended on them moving around. And so we, we evolved under those conditions, but now we live in a hyper novel mm -hmm. world where you could sit on your desk all day long and literally not even have to leave your house or your office. And, and that's a, the cumulative effects of that are, are, um, yeah, that, that worries me. Um, you know, people keep doing this, especially starting that at a young age. It's one thing to have like a person my mm. age who's sitting around all day. I mean, that's bad enough. But when you have eight-year-olds that are starting to do this, um, 
the the consequences of that in terms of mental health and physical health uh, are, are pretty pretty scary. Yeah, I mean, if you're not going out, you're not socializing, you're not doing all those other things we talked about. And I can imagine mm-hmm. people prone to overwhelm or feeling pretty overwhelmed right now because we're throwing a lot at them. The first thing you mentioned in your article is the importance of prioritizing tasks. Now, with all these things that need to get done in a week and, you know, this whole right versus right decision-making paradigm, what are your tips for prioritizing importance between works, breaks, sleep, exercise, connections, distractions? How do people figure out what is the most important thing on a given day? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Uh, And, you know, we, and it's a skill that you have to learn really. It takes a lot of practice. And so starting this at an early age, time management and thinking about how to organize your day, it's an important skill to, to cultivate and, Mm -hmm. and perfect. And it takes years and then everything changes and you have to change. But uh, I, I, for me, most things come down to this sense of belonging and I kind of filter everything through sense of belonging and how, um, you know, how do we connect with our, the people we want to be around in our, in our community. And so that's one way that I prioritize things. I think about uh, if I have a choice between task A, B, and C, um, you know, obviously deadlines, that's one way to organize things. Mm -hmm. Uh, But another way is to just think about, uh, what's most important to me and my immediate community. And so I might try to prioritize that. And, uh, you know, generally speaking, I, I try to get things done early in the day, the things that are most challenging, um, just to get those out of the way. And I know it's tempting sometimes to say, well, I can do three or four real small things real quick, get those done and then tackle the big thing. Um, but my advice is to just go right into that big thing and start working on that. I think you'll feel better at the end of the day, if you've at least tackled part of that big thing, um, instead of just checking off a bunch of very tiny boxes on your, on your to-do list. Um, right. That certainly gets you past that feeling that you're just sort of treading water running in place because you are making progress on those larger goals, um, And and I mean, I think it's interesting that you speak to that sense of community because I talk about core values on this show all the time and people go, what's a core value? And I'm like, "Ah!" (laughs) you know, like, wow, okay, back to basics. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but it's important to to think about those core values on a daily basis and go back to those basic things and say, you know, here here are the things that are really, really important to me. Mm -hmm. So I, I should bump those up on the list. And, you know, we all we all face um these challenges every day about how to organize our time and how to allocate time and energy to different tasks mm-hmm. and usually those decisions are made through trade-offs you know yep. something has to give there has to be some kind of compromise and that that for me is really the skill part that you have to learn well how if i if i push if i if i go through this very quickly i'll get on to the next thing uh but the trade off is i i didn't do a great job on the That's first right. thing i was just doing it quickly to get it done and you have to say to yourself well can i can i live with myself is that who i want to be do i want to be a person that just gets through things quickly or do i want to do the highest quality work for every single thing. And that's where the allocation of time and energy comes in because we really can't do our absolute highest quality work on every single thing we tackle. You really do have to make choices and and make adjustments and say, okay, uh, you know, here's the thing that's really important to me. So that's the one I'm going to spend most of my time on to get it the best it can possibly be. Kevin Bennett, PhD, psychology professor at Penn State. Kevin, I love the name of your upcoming podcast. Kevin Bennett is snarling. What is your podcast going to be about? So this is a podcast for overanalyzers, people that tend to overthink things Mm -hmm. like me. Uh, And I think it's a good thing. I I feel like it's a badge of honor. I overanalyze things. I think that's why I'm in psychology. Uh, But it also gets me in trouble. And so I get into this thing that I call a snarl, which is basically a Mm. tangle. So snarl really has two meanings, right? Snarl to mean like you've got this face on where you're feeling aggressive and uh, you know, even violent, you know, that's one aspect of it, but really I'm focusing on how we get tangled up in everyday life and how we can undo those tangles. And for me, it's all about understanding, uh, what, what makes us feel like we belong and not belong to our, the worlds that we've created around us. 
Uh, and that's how we decide how we can move forward and embrace new things versus cling to the past and just stick with, you know, what makes us feel comfortable. And that's really the, the, the main question for me is how we can move forward versus hold on to the past. And when do we hold on to the past and when should we move forward? These are big questions yeah. that have always plagued us throughout human history, but now they're especially challenging because the world is moving so quickly. It's really hard to tell. Should I embrace this new technology or just stick with my old ways of doing things? Should I embrace this new music and new cuisine or just stick with whatever I'm comfortable mm -hmm. with? So that that's what Kevin Bennett is snarling is, is all about. You can find out more about Kevin at kevin-bennett.com kevin-bennett.com i guess hyphen is the other word for dash two t's two n's in bennett uh kevin thanks very much for your time and thanks for coming on it's not therapy it was my pleasure thank you so much all right guys we're gonna go to break when we come back more about priorities stay tuned The following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist in the final moments of the show. Final thoughts on spoons. That never gets old for me individual mileage may vary okay before the break we were talking about priorities for your time and energy with psychologist kevin bennett and i'm gonna bring these priorities back to how to allocate those spoons if you have a question 289-275-9600 289-275-9600 or liana at nottherapyshow.com i prefer email or the contact form at nottherapyshow.com additional content you can find on not therapy show at twitter and instagram at not therapy show on twitter and instagram We're running out of spoons for the show okay when a person has fewer spoons left over to work with we're not being difficult or too rigid or too giddy or too obsessed with the word spoon or any other choice name someone likes to call me when I set boundaries of my time and energy and patience. What we're doing is we're being honest with you about what we can and can't manage. And are we afraid of rejection when we do that? Yep. Are we afraid we're going to get fired or passed over or seen as the not fun friend? Yep. Do we have a choice? Well, we could become an overwhelmed lunatic, but... That's not really a choice, is it? Now, okay, I shouldn't say we here. I'm talking about me. I've had people determine I was just too much trouble because I ran out of spoons. And that sucks. And it'd be easy to insist that the people who did it were bad people, but, you know, some of them weren't. They just might have not had the spoons themselves and they lacked an element of self-awareness. I learned to keep in mind that it's not losing an opportunity when it's an opportunity to exhaust yourself. If you don't have your health, including your mental health, it's much harder to enjoy everything else in life. So in order to get the most out of your life and your spoons, tough choices sometimes have to be made. Top 10 phrase. Core values are more important to relationships than common interests. That includes family relationships, that includes friend relationships, and yeah, that includes work relationships. If you're at a company that doesn't value its people, over time, you're going to start devaluing yourself. Trust me, you'll begin to lose the sense of what makes you you, in part because you're just so tired all of the time. Because you're out of spoons. Because even if you're totally physically healthy and have no long-term mental health challenges, you still only have so many spoons in a day. And those spoons have to cover eating right, exercising, personal development, and a reasonable amount of family and friends time, as well as work. If you don't manage your spoons effectively now, you will get ill somehow. 
I learned that far too late and it was a tough lesson. Now, might I have ended up with the same conditions anyway if I'd gone easier early in life? Maybe. But I'm the only one in my family with this stuff going on. So let's face it, lifestyle likely played a big role. And if you lose friends because you don't have enough spoons to hang out all the time, you will make new ones if you put some spoons towards socializing and making new friends, including you introverts. I am one of you. Kevin is one of you. We understand. And I am looking for a guest on the topic of making friends, but that's a, that's an interesting one. I don't know. It's a very, very recommended, not recommended, requested. There we go. Right word. Running out of spoons. Uh, it's a very requested thing among my clients about making friends. How do I make friends? you know, beyond the platitudes of put yourself out there. What does it mean to put yourself out there? I'm getting derailed. Next week, we're not going to be talking about making friends. We're going to be talking about grief. Yes, grief. I figure if I'm preparing you for losses here, talking about maybe having to leave your job, maybe having to find new friends, I better follow up with some strategies for that, right? These things are not easy. I've done it. I had to find almost a completely new friend circle. Maybe three friends lasted the great purge when I realized I was out of spoons for my social group. Again, doesn't mean they're bad people, but it was exhausting me. The demands were exhausting me because the core values weren't aligned. More in core values in coming weeks more on making friends in coming weeks. But again, next week, grief. What is it? How do you handle it? Especially, you know, if you're neurodivergent or the typical words of comfort don't comfort you. Got a great guest for that. And I want your questions. Give me an email, liana at nottherapyshow.com. That's L-I-A-N-A, nottherapyshow.com. That's N as in Nancy, not M, N. My name is not Liama, Liana. Okay, or too hard, spell my name, contact, at, contact form at Not Therapy Show. Extra content every week at Not Therapy Show on Twitter and Instagram. Until then, monitor your going to be one more spoon <laughs> crazy is only a problem if it's hurting you i think my crazy hurt some other people this week <laughs> i regret nothing spoon <laughs> see you next week take care <laughs>